Okay, we're here today on realagriculture.com with Rob Syke. Rob is founder and CEO of the AgriTrend group of companies. Uh, welcome today, Rob. Oh, glad to be here, Sean. I've been following Real Agriculture for a while and done a good job, so I'm uh, honored and delighted to be with you today. We're glad to have you as a new contributor to Real Ag, and we're looking forward to talking to you on a regular basis. That's great. Okay, Rob, we're going to talk, uh, we've turned over a new decade. Yep. Uh, it's that time of year where we sort of uh, look to the future. That's what we're going to do today. Uh, you've come up with some, you know, five points that you feel are things to look out for in the coming decade and things that you notice are happening in right. some of your travels. So let's, uh, what do you think is going to happen in, in the, this next decade ahead of us? Well, it's, uh, it's agriculture is constantly at a, at a crossroads of change and uh, that never changes. Uh, the impacts of technology are really, really uh, strong in agriculture today. And it's changing the way that uh, farmers are perceiving their business. Um, gone is the day of, uh, you know, a, a mom and pop operation running a small mix farm and uh, uh, that can still exist. In my mind, that still does exist, but it exists more in niche marketplaces such as the movement towards local vorism and stuff like that where you have somebody who's running a smaller operation producing something for an urban community that's very close by. Most farmers aren't in that position. So what I see is uh, farm operations paying a lot of attention to economies of scale. And what I mean by that is it's, uh, it costs a lot of money to buy a combine these days, costs a lot of money to buy an air seeder these days. So farmers are growing in size to take advantage of economies of scale. As that happens, they get more sophisticated in their management. And more sophistication in their management means that they're going to more and more diverse places to get the leadership skills and get the things they need to run their farms. What I'm saying here, Sean, is increasingly I see farmers becoming more and more independent in, in nature, less beholden on government programs and less beholden to any particular one supplier or uh, brand or uh, one particular way of doing things. You know, it wasn't that long ago we can all, all remember farmers got a lot of information free, so-called free, from the government. Well, that doesn't exist anymore and farmers now are having to choose where they get their information, but they're also choosing where they buy their equipment, they're choosing where they buy their crop inputs, they're choosing where to get their technology and they're choosing where to get their consultation. So the first uh, thing that I see I'd like to expand at some later point on is the fact that I see farmers getting increasingly more independent in nature. And I don't think that's going to stop and I think it's a good thing. Okay, that's, uh, that's, I very much agree with you. I see it uh, as I talk to farmers across the country and the continent, you see it, it's, it's happening big time. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, what's next? Uh, technology. Technology, the impact of technology uh, in the past decade, if you consider, uh, let's go back to 1990. In 1990, the internet was a very unknown uh, entity in agriculture, and since 1990, we've seen a absolute explosion and proliferation in the ability for farmers to gain information literally from the world in split-second timing. So that's really changed. The integration of technology on farm lags behind integration of technology in other sectors. But we're catching up very quickly. When you talk to people about agriculture, they don't have a perception of a farmer um, working with a PDA. So you've got a PDA device here, and most farmers got them today. So when you talk to uh, somebody about, I was texting my farmer, they give you one of these, and you say, no, that's, why wouldn't we? Why wouldn't we communicate very quickly? So the integration of technology on farm, I believe, is going to ramp up very, very rapidly in the next three to four years, certainly over this next decade. We're going to uh, catch up to most of the sectors of the economy. Uh, largely to do with better access to broadband capability in remote rural areas. That's really the critical component. That has largely to do with wireless technology and a new area called WiMAX, which is allowing you for, to receive signals on farm, doesn't matter where you live. And the second thing is the integration of technology between computers and, uh, and machinery allowing us as professional agrologists, for example, to do more and more work. And I'm just excited about the things we're doing, Sean, with variable rate fungicide, for example, and the integration of satellite technology and aerial imagery. And our database management capabilities are just waiting there for farmers to tap into. 
And that lends itself into the tracking ability of not only how the crop was grown, but what the crop uh, nutrients are like inside the crop. And I think that's where uh, an opportunity lies. For sure. Uh, point number three. Nutrient density. Uh, I, I kind of did a segue there for us. Uh, I believe that uh, there's a lot of movements right now if you're following consumer trends. You know, one of the movement is organics. Uh, one of the movement is uh, locovorism, which I mentioned before, the whole issue of... Well, another one is called food miles. But at the end of the day, I think the consumer is increasingly becoming more educated to understand that the critical component of food is the nutrient density inside the food. I'll give you a concrete example. We know that selenium will help males increase their resistance to prostate cancer. So why can't we grow wheat that's high in selenium? This has been done in North and South Dakota, where the wheat is bundled up from North and South Dakota and packaged in containers and sent specifically to markets in Europe where they're making bread for farmers that are going to eat that bread in the hopes of getting higher selenium. This is just the beginning. I'd like to talk someday about the Copenhagen Consensus, which is a grouping of economists that identified the top, uh, uh, the, the top problems in the world where they would lay money into and out of the top problems in the world you could spend money on, like say $75 billion, three out of the top five are nutrient related. Iron deficiency, zinc deficiency, uh, iodine deficiency, it's all related to nutrient density in food. So I think, Sean, that's a major trend. We have got some political uh, issues getting in the way of us being able to do that. And I don't need to tell the viewers exactly what I mean by that, but it's very difficult for a farmer to sell a specialty wheat in this marketplace right now. And that's getting in the way of progress. Yep. 